So this is the day two, and yesterday I also forgot to mention that uh, this is part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. I think even the coordinator forgot to mention series. And also, you know, we are in the CSIR as an organization. He was established in 1942, so we are in the 80th year of CSIR. So that also yesterday we missed because there was a, it was day one and there were some teething issues. So I would I would directly go to uh, where we stopped yesterday. That's this I have explained in detail, saying what are the first, second, third, and fourth paradigms of science, and we are a fourth paradigm institute. So we are supposed to do data intensive scientific discovery. That is big data science, and I also showed you some slides about data science. How carefully we should use. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Like, as a quote by Nobel laureate says, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. So that's not the way we should be using. We should have a solid background of science behind the data science and then use it carefully and also avoid intentional misuse and uh, because that happens because of the overload of information. So with this, I will talk about CSIR now and then Fourth Paradigm Institute. So CSIR is a Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Yesterday, these slides, we just uh, uh, glanced through them because there was no time. So today, I will uh, nicely explain so that all the students... Yesterday, these slides, we just... Hello? Uh, so today, I'll explain so that the students know about the organization so they can aim for it in future to be able to join this place. It's a very nice place to work. And I have put in almost 33 years of service here. I joined very young. So um, I thought I'll give a glimpse of CSIR. It's a Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, autonomous body under Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. So it's spread across the whole um, country, as you can see in the map. And it is headquartered at Delhi. And uh, there are almost like 37 labs and there are some unit outreach centers, innovation complexes. And there are about 3,500 scientific staff across all these organizations and a support staff of around 4,000. So that's how uh, this works. And uh, the CSIR basically is more uh, wide spectrum of research activities which have societal impact. They work on the wide spectrum, starting uh, from oceanography. Then uh, we have a huge presence in uh, biological research, which was very clearly shown during the COVID pandemic, then chemical research, then engineering research, then aeronautics. These are all uh, geophysics, earth sciences, etc. And we also have a separate wing uh, for students. It's called Academy of Scientific and Industrial Research. I didn't put it in this slide, but that's a separate vertical where students can do their master's and PhD after their uh, engineering. So that is a separate academy it is called, ACSIR it is called. And each of these labs, units, they all have programs for students like internships, Etc. and uh, project work and all for engineering students, etc. So this CSIR as a whole is ranked 37 in the and is in the top 100 global government organizations. And in the country, we are in the first position. So we belong to Fourth Paradigm Institute. As you can see in the map, we are located in Bangalore. National Aerospace Laboratories, NAL is also a CSIR aerospace organization. So we are located within the campus of NAL, Belur campus of NAL. We are called Fourth Paradigm Institute. So this is how our institute started. It's a very young institute compared to all the other labs of CSIR, for, uh, CSIR organization. So this was established as a center in 1988 to uh, basically do third paradigm of science, that is computational science. Then uh, when the big data science came into picture, sorry, then big data science, one second. Uh, so 
okay sorry so and then uh, in 2013 we are uh, uh, repositioned as an institute to do big data science so our institute basically from 1988 when it started hosted the supercomputing facility for the csir as a whole and at one point of time i think in 2012 we were the number one supercomputing facility of the country later on um, uh, other organizations also got it so even now we are the best supercomputing facility in the country the fastest and we are upgrading it also in this year uh, and we also do research in engineering majorly in engineering and earth sciences discipline so the figures which you can see here are the result of our modeling and computations in the engineering and earth sciences field like the top figure the seismic risk map basically gives the vulnerability individual vulnerability in proportion with the population density so you can see that across the himalayas the risk is very high see this is all done using very complex models and um, a lot large amount of data observed data synthetic data everything and the earthquake catalog data everything and then we do this and the other two which you can see on the right and the left side on the extreme temperature these are all our predictions from the climate uh, research activity where we give uh, predictions for extreme events like extreme temperature we gave a prediction for 72 hour lead in odisha and in uh, a thunderstorm prediction 48 hour lead in bihar etc so the this is the glimpse of our um, uh, institute and we have I think I have to go to the, the slide is not moving, Pavitra. Pavitra, we are still, uh, it, show, it still shows that CSR 4 PIE, uh, mm, seismic risk, that yeah, slide. It's not moving, so I'll escape and again I'll try the slideshow. Yes, ma'am. I think I have to unshare and share it, it looks like. Yes, ma'am. Please do that, ma'am. Now you can see? I can see the slide, ma'am. Just go to the next one. Okay. Yeah. So now it's it's moving now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So our organization has two major divisions, like I've said earlier, Earth and Engineering Sciences, Data Science and Supercomputing. So this Data Science and Supercomputing is in the fourth paradigm of science. Earth and Engineering is still in the um, third paradigm of science, but we have initiated uh, projects uh, cutting across these two disciplines so that the domain expertise of Earth and Engineering Sciences will be used uh, under the Data Science and Supercomputing which I think Asha will speak in her talk. So this map which you can see here shows all the seismic events of the Indian subcontinent which were plotted. We collected the data that was available, complete data, and then filtered it and uh, authenticity of data we checked and then we plotted this figure. So there's a lot of effort. Goes. So it shows the seismic events show the natural Indian tectonic plate boundary. See what is a plate boundary is that when a plate moves below another plate. So this is the boundary where Indian plate moves below Eurasian plate. So you can see the uh, because of that movement, the intensity of the seismic activity. Here it subtracts under Andaman plate and you can see uh, the seismic activity here. And then you also have within the plate, which are called intraplate earthquakes. These are the earthquakes which you can see in the middle. And within intraplate, I'm not sure how many students know, there was a Latour earthquake, I think in 1996 and 2001 Bhuj earthquake. And the other major earthquake uh, in the last uh, recent earthquake was in Andamans in 2004. I'm not sure because you are all must be, some of you may not have been born by the time. So that is what. And this picture on the right hand side is very nice. It, we have a cyber security test bed in our organization which captures the malicious connection. So these are the malicious connections that are captured across the world for a week in the month of September. So and all these red dots are the malicious con connections uh, generating in the network. And 
you know these dots actually represent a cluster of computer not a single computer so it gives just an idea on the uh, magnitude of the malicious activities on in the all over the world and we do research on this then we in the engineering and earth sciences we we have given our major contribution was to give a seismic hazard map for indian subcontinent which is used by bureau of indian standards for design of building codes etc so this also which is done at a 0.2 into 0.2 degree resolution so here also a lot of computation and data goes as input before we get this as an output and as you can see the one uh, the seismic risk is very high hazard is very high along the indian plate boundaries and in gujarat because of this uh, this is an intraplate uh, region and Andamans where you have that subduction, Andaman subduction zone. So this is the GPS. This, this was the talk which I gave actually on February 11th, International Day itself for CSIR Jigyasa. So this is basically the GPS. This all the students can relate because you all must be using GPS for in your mobiles and for navigation. The same GPS, a little better version of it, a dual frequency one we use for our research. See what GPS gives you in your mobiles or in navigation is the position. So we also get the position of GPS and over a period of time, if, you, if the position is measured, you get how much, what is the velocity. So we find out using GPS, these are all our, as you can see, all these black triangles are our uh, Continuous GPS stations, which are monitored since some of them have started since 1997. And from then onwards, till now, we have been monitoring. So all these stations, we measure over a period of time how much they are moving. Like I will say, Bangalore is moving around 5 centimeters per year approximately. Whereas we are also moving. See, nothing is stationary in our world. And Himalaya moves around 2 to 3 centimeters per year. So you can see I have plotted, this is all measured from GPS data and then plotted uh, the average velocity vectors of each region of moves northeast like that. So that is, it is basically updating under the Eurasian plate and the Indo-Burman, Indo uh, this is the Indo-Burman boundary. So this is how we are moving. So what do we do? We measure this movement. What do we get? What is the research we do? Is that we use this movement to see what, because this is the movement on the surface. So we say what is that within the inside subsurface structures that are moving and how they are moving. So that is what like, you know, if you take Himalayan boundary, we will give the um, subsurface structure, which is called main Himalayan thrust at a depth of 15 kilometers. If you can visualize, it is subducting below the Eurasian plate. So what? how much it is sub subducting per year? So that also we have around uh, different parts of Himalayas. It is 12 to 16 mm per year at a depth of 15 kilometers. And the width from the Indian plate is around 100 kilometers. So that is something which we get by modeling. So in, that's called inverse modeling. Similarly, if there is an earthquake, like I told you, 2004 earthquake, so we have measurements before and after earthquake. So what, how much like Port Blair has moved during that earthquake? So it has moved around 6 meters towards the Indian plate during the earthquake. Otherwise, the normal velocity of Port Blair is what you can see in the violet. But when the earthquake happened, it moved in this direction. And it also had um, the islands, like Port Blair Islands, had an uplift of about five, five uh, I think. Intelligence, how it has been used in different sectors, all these things I will explain in very simpler way, as this webinar is mainly for the school students. So this is the agenda, let us start. So in our surrounding, where we see the use of artificial intelligence, I can will explain in detail in my later slides in the different navigation apps like Google Maps, Google Live View that uses AI for image processing, for recommendation, for prediction. One example I can give if some uh, one of the user want to catch 
uh, train and if we will enable the google live view so he can know that where is the uh, elevator uh, nearer elevator so in here we can see that in our surrounding we can see the use of artificial intelligence so is it the new concept no it was first time coined in 1956 by american computer scientist john mccarthy at uh, dartmouth conference even in 1966 the first chatbot was created by joseph wieserbaum and the name of this chatbot was eliza so after that uh, ai experience uh, ai winter peers in that peers there was no enough research on ai and that happened due to the less funding from the government but after that it gained explosive growth like in 1997 ibm deep blue beats world chess champion gary kaspar and uh, 2019 11 ibm's watson own jeopardy so what is that jeopardy that is a quiz show where you need to solve the complex questions and uh, as well as riddles so here we can see that it was coined in 1956 but recently it gained the growth so what is the reason behind that because uh, currently or recently there was a advancement in sensors iots and huge amount of data are generated in different applications and different sectors and uh, as ai is the uh, data driven approach so ai can make use of those huge data it can extract the features so basically recently the data are generated in high volume velocity and veracity so you we have huge data so from this huge data we need to derive meaningful uh, information out of that so how we can do that by using the artificial intelligence so artificial intelligence can work for the small data as well as if the data is huge it it can work on those huge data as well now this is the definition of uh, ai so ai basically is a broad area of computer science that makes machines seems like they have human intelligence basically ai enables the machine to behave like a human being so we have different uh, type of ai and those are categorized based on the capabilities and functionalities of ai so based on the capabilities we can divide the ai in three categories one is weak ai then general ai strong ai and based on the functionalities we can divide the ai in four categories that is the reactive machines limited mind theory of memory and self awareness so one by one i will explain so weak ai is also known as artificial narrow intelligence and it works in narrow range of abilities like if a program is uh, designed for uh, performing specific task it will do the same task only if suppose if one machine is uh, designed for Uh, performing speech recognition it is not designed for performing image recognition it cannot do the image recognition so what are the examples uh, fall under this category like playing chess self driving car speech recognition image recognition these are the example of this category so what ai we have currently that is the weak ai or narrow intelligence ai the next ai is the general ai it is also known as artificial general intelligence it is uh, similar to human intelligence but uh, it is under the research the next is the artificial super intelligence that is strong ai it is much more capable than human and this is basically the hypothetical concept of artificial intelligence uh, one of the example i can give you know the killer robot and terminator 2 that is that we can say that that is the example of strong ai now we will see based on the functionality how we can divide the ai into uh, different categories so these two like reactive machines and limited memory machines these fall under existing ai and theory of mind and self awareness this fall under future ai so in reactive machine this kind of ai system don't store memories or past experience 
for performing future actions like IBM's Diplo machines, Google AlphaGo. So this, these are basically based on the special type of learning that is called reinforcement learning that I will explain in my later slide that uh, this reactive machines. Uh, so here the reactive machine don't store memories or past experience for performing the future actions. But in case of limited memory machine, it can store past experiences for a short period of time. Uh, we can take the example of self-driving cars. So when it navigate the navigate to the road, so it needs to store only recent speed of nearby cars, distance of other cars, and speed limit. So limited information it needs to uh, drive in a road on a road. And this theory of mind and self awareness are the future concept. Here, the uh, concept is like the AI machine will have the emotions like human beings. So what AI we have existing that uh, doesn't have the emotions, but in theory of mind, the uh, concept is like the machines will have the emotions like human being. And this is uh, this type of uh, machines are under uh, research. And next is the self awareness uh, AI. This is super intelligent and if uh, this kind of machines have their own consciousness, sentiments and self awareness and these machines are much more smarter than human beings. And uh, this is the hypothetical concept. So one of the example I can say that suppose I want to uh, go somewhere with a driverless uh, car. OK, and I inform the driverless car that where I want to go, but that the car has the enough consciousness and it doesn't want to drop me there. It will drop me the place where it wants. So you can imagine how the intelligence is. This is this both are the future concept. Now we will see that another two terms like machine learning and deep learning. What are those and how these two are related to AI? So first is that I already mentioned that this AI is basically it enables machine to behave like human human being. And if the data is huge, it has the capability to discover hidden patterns from the huge data sets. But where what is the machine learning? Machine learning is the subset of uh, AI. So it concerned with the design and development of algorithms to on uh, empirical data. So uh, machine learning has the uh, algorithms and algorithm. You know that algorithm is the steps, um, set of steps to perform certain uh, task. Uh, and deep learning is what? Deep learning is the subset of machine learning and it is much more capable than machine learning and it can uh, solve the complex problem. Now we will see in traditional programming what we'll do and in machine learning what we'll do. In traditional programming in computer what will give data and program and it will give you output. But in mach machine learning what we will give data and output and based on that it design the program or model. OK, this is the difference between traditional programming and ma machine learning. Now we will just uh, uh, I will tell little uh, more about deep learning. See deep learning is based on the artificial neural network and artificial neural network is designed based on the neural network present in our brain. So uh, you know we uh, you know that uh, it neural network consists of neurons, actions, dendrons like the same concept based on same concept artificial neural network is designed. So this is the simpler version of artificial neural network uh, in which we have one input layer, one output layer and one hidden layer. OK, and uh, like that in, in case of deep neural network, it will consist of multiple neurons, multiple layers and each layer has multiple neurons. So th that's why deep neural network can solve the very complex problem. So I will go little depart for uh, to this uh, network. So here basically uh, we have we know the input. OK, and uh, based on this input, we need to calculate the 
value of these neurons. So these the x1, x2, x3, these are the neurons and this is the hidden neurons. This is the output neurons. Suppose say this is the hidden neuron N1. So how we will calculate the value of N1? N1 is equal to, it will follow this equation. N1 is equal to x1 into w1 plus x2 into w2 plus x3 into w3 plus some bias term. Uh, it needs to consider and this equation will pass this through an activation function. So those things I'm not going in detail. So once we'll get the value of this hidden neurons and uh, suppose here the weight is W4, then this N1 and W4, if we'll multiply, we'll get the value of Y. So this is a simpler way I tried to explain. Hope you will understand. And then, uh, this is the pipeline of how ML DL algorithm work. See, uh, AI is the data driven approach. So data is data play important role. And if the data is huge, quantity of data is uh, more then it will work. But along with that, another factor matter that is the quality of data. Along with quantity, quality of data is very, very much important. So uh, when we will have the data, we need to do the data pre-processing. Data pre-processing, what does it mean? So you need to clean the data. If during the uh, acquisition process, if your data has any uh, missing value or any noise, you need to clean those data and make suitable for uh, machine learning or deep learning model. Now next come to the model design. So model design, what we'll do? Uh, here we can use the machine learning as well as deep learning. So what happens? I already show in the previous slide that in uh, machine learning algorithm, you will give input, output, and you will design the program. Okay, so in that program, what we'll do? I will give you the very simpler example. Suppose you have set of uh, images of uh, animals like in that animals you have the cats dog and this machine need to classify them so what you will do as an input you will give the images of these cats dogs and then this while training while training the machine will learn the characteristics from the data like how is their how is their uh, ears eyes all these features it will capture and learn it and once the training is over then uh, it will set the uh, weight matrix. Basically what happens, this input, you know it because these images we are giving like cats, dogs, images we are giving and this is the weights. Okay, these weights we can, the first time initially we can assume this weight as we can take those weight randomly and then we will get this value. So you will uh, repeat that process because here the uh, you know the desired output and then you will get the predicted output from this equation and then you know that what is the error. So our intention is to minimize the error and you will repeat these things iteration by iteration. When the error is minimized, we can say that this model is trained and once the model is trained, you will get these values of weights and these weights when you will give the new data and we will we can predict them. So this is the uh, just uh, how that uh, we will do the model and here during the training different type of algorithms uh, can be used based on the what problem we are solving. So once the model is designed then we will do the model evaluation. How we will do? There are different performance matrices are available, uh, available like root mean square error, mean absolute error, confusion matrix, different uh, performance matrices we need to use to evaluate that our algorithm is how our algorithm is working. So uh, here learning is important. So intelligence, what does it mean? You learn something and then from your learning, you will solve the complex problem. So here, here uh, we have four different type of learning. That is the supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning. So in my next slide, I will uh, explain them uh, with a very simple example. Suppose we have set of fruits and you are asked to classify them. So how we will do? See here you can see that we have apple, pears and mangoes. These are all 
in different colors and their shapes are also different so you can do easily but what about machines so in case of supervised learning machine knows in advance in what category in what uh, what are the classes of these fruits and uh, this input are given to the machines it knows in advance that it will it needs to uh, category them in the different classes so this is the example of supervised learning so in case of supervised learning machine knows in advance the classes of the object what it needs to uh, do the it needs to classify and next is the unsupervised learning in case of unsupervised learning machine doesn't know in advance the classes of the object so this uh, suppose in this example you can see that these are all picture of mangoes and these are uh, shapes are little bit different colors are different and for human being it is very e easy to classify them but for machines it will extract that okay these shapes are different these colors are different based on that it will cluster them in different categories so this is the unsupervised learning so here we have uh, uh, understood that in supervised learning machine knows in advance that in which category it has to cat classify but in unsupervised learning machine doesn't know in advance so what will be the classes of the uh, objects and uh, next comes the semi supervised learning in semi supervised learning consists of supervised learning as well as unsupervised learning so we can say that maybe 20% of uh, learning will be supervised and 80% learning will be unsupervised learning so next we'll come to the reinforcement learning in reinforcement learning what happens uh, here the two things are involved one is agent another is environment so agent will learn from the environment so i here i will give uh, one very simple example so that you can understand suppose uh, one small kid he doesn't know about fire so when he goes nearer to the fire he feels good because he feels warm so it will give uh, he will give positive reward but when he tries to touch that fire then uh, there is a chance of burning so he will he, he he will feel bad so he will give the negative reward so here in this case this kid is the agent and fire is the environment so that's why we are telling that uh, the agent will learn from the environment by performing actions so here performing actions means the this kid is uh, when he is touching the fire trying to touch the fire uh he felt uh, that he, there is a chance of burning so he felt bad so that's why that agent will learn from the actions uh, this is about the reinforcement learning so basically i have covered that what are the basics of uh, uh, ai how it worked and what type of learnings are available now we will see that in different sectors in different applications how uh, AI will be used like in weather, climate, or uh, uh, agriculture, healthcare, gaming, e commerce, autonomous vehicle. How AI can be used? We will see one by one. So, first, I will give the example of agriculture. Uh, you, you may not be familiar with the what are the phases of agriculture. So, that's why I want to first I will tell you that what are the phases of agriculture and uh, and then I will explain in each phase or some of the phases how we can use the AI. The first phase is the preparing the soil. If the soil has the large clumps, then uh, farmer needs to break those uh, large soil clumps. If there is a debris like sticks, rocks, that, that needs to be removed from the soil to prepare it. So this is the first phase and that is known as a soil preparation. In next phase is the uh, uh, showing of seed. So here, uh, what is the important thing? The distance between two seeds and the depth for planting seed should be uh, maintained. And next phase is the applying fertilizer. 
if the soil doesn't have enough quantity of nutrients in that case you need to apply the fertilizer because fertilizer is required for the growth of the crop next phase is the maintain soil moisture or humidity and next phase is the control of weed weed are basically the unwanted plants near the crops and it it has the very adverse effect on the yield it will decrease the yield and lower the crop quality so uh, because of that we need to control the weed next process is the harvesting here farmer what will they do they gather the ripe crops from the fields and next is the packing and transportation of crops so in these are the basically the step uh, of farming now we will see in steps uh, how we can use the uh, ai so in the first steps like uh, in preparing soil how ai can be used uh, ai can detect soil defects and recognize nutrients deficiency so ai based algorithm can find out is there uh, any deficiency in nutrients if there is any deficiency it uh, it will tell you and then farmer will act accordingly and in the uh, sowing of seed phase ai will help in determining right time of sowing and uh, for applying fertilizer how ai can help it will help in determining right amount of fertilizers to be applied because if we will apply more fertilizers then it will have the adverse effect on crop and if you will apply less uh, fertilizer it will affect the growth of the crop so right amount of fertilizers to be applied is very important and in that uh, the regard ai can help next is the crop health monitoring uh, system uh, uh, we can build Uh, the crop health monitoring system based on ai uh, like what we uh, what it can be done like we can get the images of the crops and by any uh, cameras like uh, drone or something and then those images we will fit to the ai algorithm and those uh, ai algorithm uh, will tell you is there any chance of disease and what kind of disease so that uh, farmer can take preventive measures so like that uh, one of the example i am giving this is the berlin uh, berlin based startup company its name is pet it developed uh, plantix uh, and this plantix is the crop monitoring uh, system based on ai it did it does this kind of activity next is the for wheat controlling how we can use the ai so here we can use the ai sensor and that can detect and target weeds so what kind of weeds uh, are there and what uh, it will decide uh, based on that we can decide that what type of herbicides to be applied on that region and next is the in harvesting phase uh, how the ai can be used uh, here we can design the driverless uh, tractor uh, based on ai which can collect the crops so in new holland uh, and introduced autonomous tractors in 2016 it is not in india this is in uh, new holland so here we have seen in the different uh, phases of agriculture how we can use ai even few companies uh, designed a ai based uh, uh, instrument which can pick the ripe tomatoes automatically this i have not shown now we will see that in healthcare sector how the ai can be used see when you fall sick you go to the doctor doctor will diagnose you and based on your symptoms doctor will take decision and uh, give you the treatment so in this phase can ai be used yeah there is a, a health checker app available currently name is ada if you feed your symptoms it will give you uh, the result sometimes it may not be correct but people are happy with that even for early detection of disease suppose you are not well for long time and doctor advise you do the blood test and then you will go to the lab and uh, give your blood samples so after collecting the blood samples what the technicians do they prepare the slides they take the blood drops in a slide and they process that slide uh, using different solutions and then once the slide is processed they put under the microscope 
and then uh, that technician or that who is the medical professional he will see uh, this black slides through this microscope and decide is there any abnormalities for malaria detection sort of things we can use so we will see that how the here we can apply ai once the slides is ready we will put under the microscope and then we'll take the images of those slides and those images we will fit to the ai based algorithms and then ai based algorithm will tell you that this samples is parasite samples or uninfected samples or is there any abnormalities so in early detection we can use the ai in this way and uh, nowadays uh, some health monitoring devices uh, are available like uh, wearable health tracker are available which will monitor your heart and activity level and uh, nowadays the digital consultation is also available uh, equiza one company who developed ecg enabled digital stethoscope and which can detect heart uh, rhythm abnormalities and range of uh, range of other heart disease and uh, another uh, startup company designed that ai care monitors so it will monitor the uh, medication used by patients it this app basically monitor that uh, patient is taking the medicine in correct time or in uh, uh, right medicines so those things it can do it and nowadays uh, how, how nowadays uh, research is going on that how the ai can be used in different uh, uh, medical sectors like uh, radiology uh, sectors is is there in is there cancer is there or not patients is suffering from cancers or not and if patients has the uh, brain tumor or not or, or uh, uh, like that cancer detection skin cancer detection ai can be used so basically this is uh, uh, under the research that re really by using the ai by analyzing those radiology image or neurology image the disease detection can be possible or not now we will come to the uh, weather and climate sectors so uh, here uh, ai can be used to predict the different weather parameters like how the tomorrow's temperature is how the wind speed so those things we can do using ai even in our institute you have worked on uh, uh, this uh, areas like we have uh, designed and developed uh, uh, deep learning based algorithm for predicting uh, atmospheric temperature wind speed oceanic chlorophyll uh, sea surface temperature basically this oceanic chlorophyll and sea surface temperature will help in identifying potential uh, fishing zones and even for uh, predicting extreme weather events also ai can be used uh, like uh, extreme events like cyclone flood drought these are very complex events and uh, now basically these are uh, solved by using the uh, mathematical model but there is a ai is evolving to solve these problems next in uh, in another other sectors how ai is used like uh, this is the gaming here you can see that this robot is playing chess with that person that we can assume that this robot has the same uh, level of intelligence like uh, human like google's alpha zero is the chess playing game and that is based on the deep neural network what i already mentioned in my previous slides and this is based on the reinforcement learning where i have given the example of the small kid when he tries to uh, touch uh, fire how uh, he felt bad so this is basically the reinforcement learning so these uh, learning algorithms are used to design this kind of games now we'll see the chatbot when you will open the browser then you can see that uh, there is a, a chatbot comes and they started uh, conversation with you so chatbot this word comes from where this word comes from the uh, chat robot and this is what is this this is basically a computer program that simulates human conversation by the uh, either via voice or text so how this chatbot uh, works it uh, does the lang natural language processing this is also part of deep neural network deep learning 
now uh, we will see that how ai can be used in transport sectors this is the driverless car this is basically the google's autonomous vehicle here driver is not there so how it will navigate so in this car in different uh, parts of the car it has sensors uh, cameras so those sensors what uh, they will do they will captures the images from uh, uh, surroundings and process those uh, images and based on this processing it plots path and sends instruction to the cars uh, actuators and the cars actuators what it will do it will control acceleration braking and steering based on that image what uh, they captured and after that important thing is the obstacle avoidance uh, this is very important if Uh, this algorithm if it will not work properly this uh, there is a chance that car may uh, make a accident so what are the uh, algorithms are involved over here like hard coded rules object recognition obstacle avoidance uh, algorithm predictive algorithm so i am not going in deeper into the algorithm part but overall i am giving the overview that how this uh, car works now we will come to the recommendation system uh, uh, you often do the shopping online shopping in amazon uh, or some other portal so what uh, they use they use the recommendation system in this recommendation system what they do they predict the user's choice and offer relevant uh, suggestion to the users okay so this uh, thing is that recommendation system can be designed based on the two algorithm one is the collaborative filtering another is the context based filtering in collaborative filtering what happens uh, in layman language i am trying to explain suppose two user user 1 and user 2 in past they have the similar choice they bought similar items so uh, there is a chance that in future they may buy similar product so that's why here the important thing is the profile of the user's preference so uh, that what item they are buying that is not import, important here the importance is the what they are uh, preferring and next is the content based filtering here the description of the item is important and uh, and uh, information of the user preference also so here basically what happens when uh, a user watching a movie like movie recommendation uh, case the content based filtering uh, is used so what happens it will captures the description of item for movie recommendation what are the description like uh, who are the actors or actress who are the uh, who is the director what what type of movie it is how what is the duration and uh, those uh, this, these are the description of the item so with this description of the item the user preference will they will map it and then based on that they will recommend you the movie of your choice so uh, this is basically what we do in our organization i already told that uh we have designed few uh, algorithms uh, based on deep learning for uh, predicting different uh, uh, in uh, means weather uh, parameters like wind temperature and different oceanographic parameter like chlorophyll uh, then sea surface temperature and for crop prediction we have designed uh, our own algorithm based on the existing algorithm and i will not uh, go deeper in that this so with this i would like to conclude my talk thank you thank you thank you all for the session we are now open for the questions if anybody has any queries you can just type in the chat box and i shall read from there
Asha? Yes. I, uh, we shall wait for a minute or two. Okay, fine. And then they will take time to post na, from the school, so you'll have to wait. I think we gave contact details with their questions. They can send it. I think. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, even I was thinking about that. Uh, because with the, the, these network issues, now it's not going to work. Okay, okay. I really thank each and every one of you for logging in today. And we are once again sorry for the technical glitches that you have to endure along with us. Hopefully, the session was helpful to you. At the end of the. Um, or under the chat box, we will put in our uh, email details for any questions you can send us there. Um, tomorrow we have our final session by Dr. G. C. Anupama, Wonders of the Cosmos at 11 a.m. in our CSF OPR YouTube channel. Please, you can check on our yesterday's paradigms of science and physics of summer monsoon videos on our CSR YouTube channel, ma'am. Jeremy, no. would you like to add something? No, it's fine. It's already late. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Do like, share the video and subscribe to our channel. Until tomorrow, goodbye. Take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.